Hello and welcome back to Supposedly Fun. My name is Greg and I am here today to take a look at Publishers Weekly's best books of 2022. I'm going to actually do two things in this video with their list. So they chose their top 10 books of the year, which has five fiction and five nonfiction. I'm going to focus in on the five fiction books from that list and then I'm going to move to their favorite fiction books of the year, which is a little over 10, I believe, and is a different list of books than what appears in their overall top 10. I guess their overall top 10 is its own thing, so you, you can't appear on both lists. So we're going to take a look at both. I had mentioned in my last Friday Reads video that I'm going to try not to do... I'm sort of questioning how I operate, and one of the things I questioned was whether or not I'm going to do a whole lot of reaction videos and things like this, and I decided I'm going to continue doing them. I am going to preface it with an introduction to try to... because I've been getting a lot of negative comments on the channel recently, and a lot of it is from people who see videos like the one I'm about to do and get very inexplicably mad about the fact that I haven't read the books that are on these lists and how can I possibly review these books if I haven't read them. And allow me to clarify, as I have in those other videos, but like, I'm not reviewing these books. I'm going to take a look at the lists, celebrate books that I've read and enjoyed. I don't think there are really any books to complain about that I, that I have not liked, but you know, and do quick little evaluations about whether or not I want to read these books. I like these lists because they're good tools of discovery. The Publishers Weekly list is one that I have not done a reaction to when they've done their favorite books of the year so far in the past, but it's a little bit off the beaten path. It tends to have a lot of books that you don't see on other year-end best lists, so I thought it would be fun to go through it and see what's on it and if there are any new discoveries in here and we can go from there. I will promise I'm not going to do a lot of reactions to best of lists for the end of the year because I feel like it gets cheaper the more you do it, but I thought this might be a fun one to try. Uh, so let's dive in and again we're going to start with the top 10 fiction books and again one more time these are not reviews for the ones that I haven't read, I'm just going to talk about whether or not I would like to read them based on the short little blurb that Publishers Weekly provides. And I will have links to both the top 10 and the favorite fiction books down below. The first book on the list in Publishers Weekly's top 10 books of 2022 is Activities of Daily Living by Lisa Sao Chen. Here is the quick blurb. The premise is deceptively simple. A Taiwanese-American woman takes care of her white stepfather who has dementia while working on an unspecified project about a Taiwanese performance artist. With these spare components, Chen pulls off an astounding meditation on the nature of art, time, and mortality. That does sound really interesting. This was a book I was pretty unfamiliar with before seeing this list. and I did kind of browse through the top 10. I think given that it's about mortality, and that's been a tough issue for the last year for me, I am not going to seek it out right now. If you think that this is something I should keep on my radar, like on my list, so I can circle back to it next year when the idea of a book about mortality is not crushing <laughs> and depressing for me, let me know. Right now, just based on that, I'm inclined to pass it by. I'm staring at the design for the jacket, because when I quickly looked at this earlier, I assumed that was an, a waffle, <laughs> like an Eggo waffle in the middle of the jacket. And uh, now that I'm looking at it, no, it is not. I think it's supposed to be apartment, like an apartment building or windows. I don't know. It's definitely not a waffle. <laughs> so, oops. Uh, but that is the first book, uh, the first fiction book on their top 10. And again, I'm only going to focus on the fiction books on that list. The next one is All the Lovers in the Night by Mieko Kawakami, translated from the Japanese by Sam Bett and David Boyd. I have still not read a, a Mieko Kawakami book, and I feel like I really need to get around to it. Um, the one that was released last year, and I'm blanking on the name, it was shortlisted for the Booker International Prize, sounded a little difficult. So I think that's probably one that I would... Not difficult in the subject matter, and it probably relates to a bit of like trauma that I carry with me from my own adolescence. So I don't know about that one. And of course, there's Breasts and Eggs, but I, I've heard some a little bit mixed things, mostly positive about that, but I've heard mostly positive about this one. So let's see what they say. The best of a wondrous, loosely connected trilogy from Kawakami after Breasts and Eggs and Heaven. 
heaven is the other book. The, this lush ambulatory narrative offers an unsparing examination of the loneliness and alienation of a young proofreader in Tokyo and her gradual emergence into the city's nightlife. The author's beautiful descriptions provide a feast for the senses, one that's merely hinted at by the film Lost in Translation. So this does sound like a book that I would really be interested in. I, I don't have any plans to try to cram it in before the end of the year, but definitely one that I am interested in. I apologize, my dog is growling at something, probably just the wind. Uh, so yeah, that is something I would be interested in. I am not going to be rushing out to get a copy. I have been wanting to read a Miyako Kawakami book for about two years now and have not gotten around to it. So hopefully I will. It's just probably not going to happen this year. And if you have read Miyako Kawakami, please let me know what you think would be a good starting point. I'm inclined to think All the Lovers in the Night is where I would begin. But let me know in the comment section down below. The next book is something that is shortlisted for the National Book Award, I believe. And I did a reaction to the long list, which I'll put down below, but I was on vacation when they announced the shortlist, so I haven't done that. I also included this book in a list of books that I wasn't sure I wanted to read that were releasing in the second half of the year. I'll put that one down below as well. It's The Birdcatcher by Gail Jones. And Gail Jones first jumped onto my radar because she was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize this year. And I was really excited to read Palmyra as the book that was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize after I first heard about it. And then I learned more about the book and the way she wrote it. And I started actively questioning whether or not it was something I want to read. And I decided to leave it alone. Basically, the gist of it is, uh, and a lot of this came from a specific YouTube video from a, a booktuber who is Brazilian and talked about how problematic Gail Jones's depiction of Brazil and Brazil's history with slavery was in Palmares and how kind of gross it was that she decided not to set her book in the United States in order to avoid all of our preconceived notions about slavery and what slavery was, except she kind of co-opted another nation's history and just didn't really care about that process. So I decided not to read that book. My feelings about that are still a little complicated. Gail Jones is an author who was discovered by Toni Morrison, and I love Toni Morrison. I've heard really great things about her previous books. It had been a really long time before she released Palmares. Uh, she had a long gap in publishing. And Birdcatcher sounds really interesting, but it is also set in another part of the world, and I worry that it's going to fall into some of those same traps. I don't know. I haven't really made up my mind. The reviews like critical reviews that I have seen have been positive. I don't actually know anyone personally who has read it yet. And I haven't really seen it popping up too much on BookTube or at least my corner of BookTube yet. So I'm kind of waiting and seeing, but I'm very hesitant to commit to whether or not I would read it. Here's the description of it. What a treat to find Jones publishing again, with last year's massive Palmares ending a two-decade hiatus. This one's even better, not only because of its wickedly funny premise, an artist keeps trying to kill her husband and he keeps taking her back, but because of its striking and stubbornly relevant commentary on the racial inequities faced by its black characters in the 1980s. I think another part of it is that in my reading about Gail Jones, she had a very complicated relationship with a, a, a husband who I believe died possibly by suicide. I can't remember the circumstances. There was definitely men mental illness at play. So again, part of me is wondering how much this is fictional, how much it's perhaps based on her own life. I love the idea of what the topic is doing and that idea of talk talking about racial inequities faced by the black characters. I just don't know how I feel about her approach to these topics in these two recent books. So we will leave it at that. I said I wasn't going to talk about nonfiction, but I want to briefly mention Ducks, Two Years in the Oil Sands by Kate Beaton, which is a graphic novel or graphic memoir about her time working in the remote male-dominated oil drilling camps in Northern Canada. I actually immediately put that book on hold in my library and I can't wait to read it. So I'm not going to talk about it, but it was on their list of the 10 best books uh, on the nonfiction side, and I put it on hold. So just throwing that out there. The next fiction book on the list is The Furrows, an elegy by Namwali Serpel. Here's what they say. A straightforward description of this inspired and wildly inventive novel is that it's about grief, as a young woman repeatedly wonders whether she's seeing her dead brother's face in the faces of strangers. He drowned when he and the women were children. His body never recovered. But a breathtaking shift halfway through in which Serpel riffs on Hitchcock's vertigo makes this one of a kind. 
Now, Molly Serpel wrote a book called The Old Drift a couple of years ago. I don't, I don't remember exactly what year, and I've heard good things about it. I feel like if I were going to pick up one of their books, I would probably go to The Old Drift. I had not even heard that they had released another book, and I certainly haven't heard much about it other than this feature on this top 10 list. So if you have feedback about it, please let me know in the description box down below. But I feel like I would probably be more likely to get to The Old Drift before I would seek this one out. I'm going to skip ahead on a couple of books to get to the last book that they have in their top 10, which is the final fiction book. It's The Rabbit Hutch by Tess Gunty. I actually just finished reading this book. It's the first one on this list that I have read. And I had a sort of complicated feelings about it. I talked about it at great, not at great length, but uh, for a couple of minutes at the end of my most recent Friday Reads video, which is a really long video, but you can skip to the Friday Reads portion with a timestamp in, I'll link it down below. And so you can skip to the Friday Reads portion and it it is one of the last books that I discuss in that video if you'd like to get my full thoughts on it. I thought it was sort of listless in the beginning, but it, it eventually sort of feels like it's mirroring the listlessness that comes with depression. And I thought that was really interesting. It does a lot of really interesting things with its characters. Um, it has a lot of characters, perhaps too many. It's a bit of a messy book, but it does do a lot of really interesting things. These sort of protagonists or like the central four characters are foster kids who have aged out of the system and are trying to figure out what to do with their life. They have dreams, they have trauma that they're carrying with them. They don't necessarily know how to navigate the world. They're unprepared for the world in a lot of ways. And the center, as much as there is a center, is the only female of that group whose name is Blondine. That is a name that she has chosen for herself because she is obsessed with mystics. And it, again, it's a bit of a messy book, but it's definitely a book that I'm going to be thinking about and dissecting for a long time. It's going to stay with me, I think. So I, I can see why it end up, ended up on a list like this. It is also a finalist for the National Book Award. And again, that video where I react to the long list for the National Book Award is going to be down below because I did not do a reaction to the short list. So their blurb is, Gunty's Titanic debut reads like the assured and focused work of a writer five books deep. The story is about a bunch of semi-feral teens and other residents of a building in a fictional Rust Belt city, and it centers on a young woman's horrific stabbing. This excellent character development and harrowing details are conveyed in some of the best prose around. So there you go. That is The Rabbit Hutch by Tess Gunty, and that concludes the fiction portion of their top 10 books of 2022. So from there, let's pivot to their best fiction list, which has 20 books on it. And we'll sort of quickly go through those. And again, none of these also appear on the top 10 list. But you, I guess you can't appear on both. So this seems like an interesting list. Let's get going. The first one is The Candy House by Jennifer Egan. I've heard a lot of love-hate things about this book. Some people enjoy it. Some people really did not. And then some people just are a little bit in the middle even and don't quite see why it was necessary. It's a sort of spiritual sequel to uh, A Visit from the Goon Squad, which won Jennifer Egan a Pulitzer Prize for fiction. Here's what Publishers Weekly says. Once again, as in A Visit from the Goon Squad, Egan stretches the bounds of the novel. The speculative story is about technology and those who design it and those who elude its pervading connectivity. There's plenty of dazzling innovation in style and form, but the greatest riches are in the many luminous insights on her characters. I do want to read this book at some point. I have not gotten around to it. I do have a copy of it on audio. I'm thinking at some point I want to reread A Visit from the Goon Squad for my Pulitzer Prize project where I'm trying to read every book that has won the Pulitzer Prize for fiction. I did read it when it came out. I feel like I would like to reread it as part of that project and when I do, which will probably be next year, I would likely do the candy house as well. I'm kind of waiting until I will have time and energy to devote to a reread of A Visit from the Good Squad as well as a read of the candy house. So I am interested in this book and finding out where I stand on it, but uh, it's definitely going to wait until at least next year. <laughs> the next one is Companion Piece by Ali Smith. Smith follows up her Torn from the Headlines Seasons Quartet with a sublime narrative involving a London artist named Sandy whose telephone encounter during lockdown with a strange woman sends her into a rabbit hole involving a parallel story of a 13th century English history. 
There's a delightful knot of ideas to untangle and Sandy's return to human company makes this glorious and life affirming. I'm always very hesitant of Ali Smith because I tried, I think, two of the seasonal quartet books. One of them I really didn't get far at all before I stopped reading it. And the other one I think I judged as part of the booktube prize and I really didn't get along with it. So I'm at a point now where I just think that it's fine. A lot of people love her books and that that's great. I am happy that she is. She's clearly a very talented writer. She doesn't seem to be a writer that I respond to. And I've tried. So I think at this point, I'm pretty much done. That could change. I don't think this is the book that's going to do it. And I'm still very stressed out by the pandemic. So the idea of doing a book that deals with lockdown and the end of lockdown right now isn't something that I'm interested in. So this is one that I will definitely pass on. The next one is the first one that I own and I have not had a chance to read yet because it just came out. It's Demon Copperhead by Barbara Kingsolver, which has been blessed by Oprah, which I did not actually know until the book arrived here. I had pre-ordered it from the Montana Book Company and it just, that little detail had slipped me by. I'm a big fan of Barbara Kingsolver. I have read three of her books. The Poisonwood Bible is fantastic. I love that book. It was a Pulitzer Prize finalist. I can't remember what beat it, but I almost feel like it probably should have won. I read The Bean Trees and really liked that book as well. I have not read the sequel to The Bean Trees, and I, the other one I read is Unsheltered, which is one of her more recent books. It's a little bit messy, but I really liked everything that she did in this that book. I'm really looking forward to this one. It seems like it touches on a lot of Barbara Kingsolver's predominant themes in her work, and it is a sort of Appalachian retelling of David Copperfield, Demon Copperhead. So that makes it really interesting as well. I have not read David Copperfield, but I feel like I, I can go into this just fine. So I'm hoping that this is going to be my next book. Here's what they say about it. The hero of King Solver's teeming and masterly social realist epic, an update of Dickens's David Copperfield, shuffles through foster care as a preteen in rural Virginia before sleeping, slipping into his own opioid addiction after a high school football injury. The author makes every sentence count and tackles bulky social issues, all while delivering a spectacular story. I'm really looking forward to this. So this is one that I already had on my radar because I had pre-ordered it. It just came out a week ago, and I'm really looking forward to getting to it. I am hoping to cram this one in before the end of the year, for sure. And we'll see if I manage to pull that off. The next book is Devil House by John Darnielle. Darnielle, author and musician behind The Mountain Goats, addresses the massive popularity of true crime with a metafictional narrative that simultaneously tells a lurid story of murder and digs into a true crime writer's reckoning with the conventions of the genre. It works brilliantly on both levels, satisfying readers' desires while giving them pause. And that is something that sounds pretty interesting to me. I used to enjoy true crime, not in the sense that I would like read a lot of true crime books, but I did like them. And I've recently done a bit of an about face on the topic. I'm much more careful about how I interact with and ingest true crime stories. They can be very lurid, as this kind of indicates, and they can be sensational. They can manipulate and exploit the victims and the families of the victims, and they can almost sensationalize the person who perpetrates the crime in so all of which is to say I do think the topic of this sounds interesting I don't really go along with thriller or horror books and this sounds like it at least sort of has thriller elements to it certainly the cover seems to imply that so I'm interested in, but I'm holding off this probably would be the right time to do it. We're in Halloween season and I just, I don't feel like I need to rush it. I have other things that I'm doing for that. So maybe, you know, winter vibes can get a little spooky or thrillerish. So maybe around then, but I, this is one that I am interested in reading, but I'm not in any rush to get to and procure a copy of. Um, because it is running parallel to a re-examination of true crime that I have been having as well. So that makes it interesting to me. Next is Dinosaurs by Lydia Millet. 
They say a middle-aged man, heir to an oil fortune, befriends his new neighbors in Phoenix, Arizona, does volunteer work, and looks out for the bullied boy next door in Millet's powerful study of toxic masculinity. This will leave readers considering the limits of good intentions. So her last book was shortlisted for the National Book Award and popped up on a couple of year-end best lists. I didn't feel too inclined to read it. It was called The Children's Bible, and it sort of mirrored biblical stories, but told with children who struck out on their own in a flood and um, kind of dealt with like environmental collapse and things like that. It, it, and maybe specifically because of the biblical angle, I just didn't feel all that interested. But from some reviews that I've seen of dinosaurs, I do feel like this is the one that could get me to read a Lydia Millet book, and I don't think I'll prioritize it before the end of the year, but I am intrigued. So we'll see how that goes. And if you have read either Lydia Millet book, please let me know in the comment section down below. Next is a particularly interesting one. It's Dr. No by Percival Everett. I have not yet read a Percival Everett book, but he jumped onto my radar when he was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize, not this past year, the one before for his book, Telephone. And it really feels that since that happened to him, his stature as an author has been going up and up and up. He was a finalist for the Booker Prize this year for Trees, which I thought could have been a good contender for the Pulitzer Prize. It ended up not even being a finalist, but it definitely feels like Percival Everett has gone from being an obscure writer, maybe with a sort of level of cult appeal, to being someone who is on the national stage. And that is a very interesting transition, and I'm really looking forward to reading Trees. Dr. No is a really interesting book kind of out there. It feels like he was building momentum towards something like a Pulitzer, and this might not be the book that's going to get him over the finish line, but it does also sound like it's something that's certainly not going to hurt his career or um, stall that progress. He's still adding very rich layers and conversation to the conversation his work has already been doing. Here's what they say about it. Everett's delightfully unhinged James Bond spoofs involves a black billionaire's plot to hit Fort Knox, which is phase one in his scheme to avenge the murder of his parents at the hands of a white police chief. With satire as sharp as a baddie's worst weapon and set pieces more bonkers than Moonraker, Everett shows off his formidable powers. So you can see it's a spy spoof and sort of like an action novel, but it still touches on all of the themes that have really put Percival Everett in that spot where he has international attention right now. So that makes it really interesting. I, I definitely would do Trees first, maybe go back to Telephone before I would pick this one up. But it also sounds like it could be potentially fun because it has that different spin on this topic. It certainly sounds interesting. So that is Dr. No by Percival Everett. Then we get to Either Or by Elif Bouteman. With this radiant sequel to The Idiot, Bouteman has achieved campus novel perfection. Selen, now in her second year at Harvard in the mid-1990s, is starting to feel disenchanted. Her friends are pairing off and her crush is elusive. Funny set pieces, like an s and themed party, add dimension to the insightful philosophical flights. Batman's outdone herself with this one. The Idiot had a very quiet release when it was originally published. It did become a Pulitzer Prize finalist. It lost inexplicably to Less by Andrew Sean Greer, and I have a whole video about Less's Pulitzer Prize win. I'll put it in the description box down below if you'd like to check that out. There are there's definitely another book that was not a finalist that I would say should have won, but The Idiot was in the mix. And it feels like in the years since, a lot of people have discovered it, and it's become almost like a cult classic in modern times. And that, that does sound really intriguing, and I have not gotten around to reading it. Because Either Or is a sequel, I feel like I would have to go back and do The Idiot first, and I'm not opposed to doing that, but also, again, I'm not really in a rush to do it. So, so far... There have not been a lot of books that I was completely unfamiliar with by the time they landed on this list. Really, oddly, the ones that I was most unfamiliar with were on their 10 best <laughs> uh, for the year. But um, it just throwing that out there. And actually, the, it's great timing that I mentioned that because now we get to a book on their fav favorite fiction list that I have not heard of at all. Human Blues by Alyssa Albert. 
Albert unfurls a hilarious and profane portrayal of a folk punk singer-songwriter who's a bit obsessed with Amy Winehouse and hopes to have a child. Jokes bend into rants and vice versa about Jewish guilt, monogamy, and the industrial fertility complex, and the whole thing culminates in a consummate and moving ending. I mean, it sounds like it could be interesting based on that blurb, which is the only thing I know about this book at all. So if you have feedback, let me know in the comment section down below about this book. But it doesn't sound like anything I would gravitate toward. This seems like an easy pass for me. It doesn't seem like something I would enjoy, or it doesn't seem like it touches on a lot of issues that really speak to me and I would be interested in. So that one seems like a safe pass. But if you want to change my mind, let me know why and show your work in the comment section down below. That takes us to Lessons by Ian McEwen. I have had a sort of rocky relationship with Ian McEwen. I read Atonement when it was first published and really liked it. And then I read Saturday and really did not like it. So, and oddly, because I really did not like Saturday, it completely stalled my progress working through any other Ian McEwen books. And I feel like at some point I should try another one. I don't think this is going to be the one. I, when it was being released, I saw the description of it and didn't really grab me. They say, McEwen's decades-spanning masterpiece tells the story of an Englishman stamped by boyhood trauma in the 1950s. As Roland lives through moments of disaster both historical, the Chernobyl meltdown, and personal, an unfriendly and misleading memoir published by Roland's ex-wife, McEwen elicits a staggering depth of feeling for the protagonist. And again, I feel like I would probably go back to some older Ian McEwen books before thinking about picking this one up. But again, if you have read it and you think I should change my mind, let me know in the comment section down below. Next is Living Pictures by Polina Barskova, translated from the Russian by Catherine Chiapiello. In an amazing mixed genre feat, Barskova compiles and embellishes stories of those who survived the siege of Leningrad during World War II. The author also includes reflections on her own childhood in Leningrad and adulthood in the U.S. with stories that bridge a gulf of understanding between herself and her grandparents' generation. It sounds really interesting. It seems like a blend of fiction and nonfiction, and I think there are definitely books on this list that I'd probably pick up first. You could convince me to do this before Ian McEwan and before um, the Albert book that we talked about, but it sounds interesting, but there are definitely other things that I would prioritize on this list and uh, it is what it is. Then there's New and Selected Stories by Cristina Rivera Garza, translated from the Spanish by Sarah Booker and others. Mexican author Rivera Garza charts love and danger in Mexico City and beyond in this knockout collection. Whether chronicling a murder investigation, reflecting on migration, or deploying inventive forms such as an anthropologist's blog, the author displays her genius in myriad ways. This seems even more likely to end up on my list at some point. I am definitely not going to run out, find a copy, and try to get to it anytime soon. But those those ideas do sound appealing um, to me as a reader. This was another one that I was really unfamiliar with. So although I am not going to immediately seek it out, let me know if you think I should change my mind in the comment section down below. Then we get to another one that I have read, and one that I own, and one that I absolutely love. Night of the Living Res by Morgan Salty. These are linked stories that follow the life of a, a man who grows up in the Penobscot Nation, and his family, and the struggles they have with a, substance abuse, with trauma, and you know physical abuse, and poverty and a whole lot, lot of things. It is surprisingly funny. This collection really builds momentum as you go through. I'm a huge, huge, huge fan of it, and I hope that more people will discover it. I finished it on audio and immediately had to go out and buy a copy because I loved it that much that I wanted to have a copy in my collection. Here's what they say about it. Talty's knockout collection looks at a family on the Penobscot reservation in the 1990s and at a young man dealing with opioid addiction in the present day. Throughout, a series of abandoned or spoiled hunting trips establishes a theme of dreams squashed, and the author brings breathtaking focus to his characters. The characters really do sing in this book, and it's a little bit bleak, but by the end, this book will leave you gasping. I really am a big fan of it, in case you can't tell. 
The next one is Scattered All Over the Earth by Yoko Tawada, translated from the Japanese by Margaret Mitsutani. With Japan obliterated from the map in a post-apocalyptic near future, a refugee builds a new life in Denmark where her interest in languages draws her into a ragtag group of linguists. It turns into a wondrously complex story of cultures colliding, languages morphing, and hidden narratives. Once opened, it's hard to pull away from. It sounds interesting, sounds a little too much for me, so it doesn't immediately grab my attention, doesn't seem like something I would seek out, but I can see why it would be a good book and why it would end up on a list like this. It certainly sounds like something that would appeal to a lot of readers, just not me. But again, if you want to change my mind, let me know in the comment section down below. Next is Seasons of Purgatory by Sharia Mandanapur, translated from the Persian by Sarah Khalili. The exiled Iranian writer brings a timeless quality to the, these harrowing stories of violence and war, which often bring a sense of human immediacy to his strange occurrences. Whether in an account of two soldiers' frightening encounter with a leopard or another dissembling after he's wounded, Mandanapur evokes an unsettling fascination for his nightmarish situations. I'm going to leave this up, the re full review of this book open because that does sound interesting and I'm going to kind of check around to see if my library has a copy. I don't think I would prioritize it by the end of the year, but that does sound like something I would want to read. So I'm going to look a little more into it once I'm done filming and uh, see if it's something that I would like to add to my TBR. I'm probably not going to run out and purchase a copy. So hopefully either one of the subscription apps that I use or the library will have a copy and we'll go from there. Next is The Sleeping Car Porter by Suzette Mayer. Canadian writer Mayer pulls off an achingly good portrait of a black train porter on a transcontinental trip in 1929. He faces many challenges, not the least of which is the need to stay awake, and Mayer captures the surreal notes of his delirium in stunning prose. That does sound interesting. It doesn't give a whole lot away. I'm actually going to open the full review to look further into that as well. It was a book that I'm completely unfamiliar with. It sounds like it could be interesting, but I kind of want more about it before I commit either way. So I'm going to do that once I'm done filming. I'm jumping in from the following day when I'm editing this video to say that I did look into The Sleeping Car Porter and it sounds amazing. I am really hoping to read it. My library does not have a copy. It's not on any of my subscription apps. And unfortunately, the book is backordered at the moment, but I am definitely going to be keeping my eye out to see when I can get a copy. I might do audio grab a copy of it on Libro or something like that, because uh, if the physical book is backordered and it just came out a month ago, it's definitely something I'm really interested in reading. What that tiny description doesn't cover is that there's an LGBTQ element. This is a black queer man who is a train porter in 1929. He dreams of becoming a dentist, and it's about inequities in really interesting ways because these passengers can do anything they compl can complain about anything and it could impact his life they could do anything to him and it just sounds really fascinating so i am hoping to find a copy of this book and this is exactly the sense of discovery that i love from these lists and why i like doing these reaction videos because this is something that i probably never would have heard of otherwise, and it's something that I'm really excited to read now. So I just wanted to give you that update because this really does sound like an incredible book, and it definitely bears a closer look. So I'll leave it at that and let you get back to the rest of the video. Next is another one I had not heard of, Solenoid by Mircea Cartarescu, translated from the Romanian by Sean Cotter. A failed writer's diary swells into a marvelous, fantastical vision of the 1970s and 80s Bucharest, where he lives on a structure built to tap into the fourth dimension and joins up with a group of anti-death people in hopes of getting there. What follows is a dizzying quest of Kafkaesque proportions. Sound interesting. My knee-jerk reaction is that it doesn't sound like something I'm going to be interested in for myself. I hope other people will watch this video, as with any of them, any of the ones that I've said I'm not particularly interested in. I hope people watching this video might be interested and will seek those books out as well. That's the whole point of doing this, sense of discovery and finding books you might not otherwise have discovered. So this one doesn't immediately grab my attention, but maybe it grabs yours and I hope you seek it out and I hope you will let me know what you think of it if you do. 
The next one is The Swimmers by Julie Atsuka. This does sound like a book that I would want to read. I'm not going to try to cram it in by the end of the year. I'm familiar with it. Um, maybe next year. It does sound like something that I would like to read. When a pool beloved by lap swimmers must close after a crack is discovered in it, the stage is set for a transcendent meditation on the nature of habit, community, and memory. And after one of the swimmers gets dementia and moves into a nursing home, Atsuka delivers an account of life's final phase that will touch even the stoniest reader. So the reason I'm holding off is that it has that element of like dementia and decline and mortality, and that is not something I could really deal with right now given the way things have gone the last year in my personal life. So that's why I'm saying that it's not something I'm going to prioritize. I am interested in reading it. I read Julia Tsuka's last book, which was The Buddha in the Attic, and I didn't love it, but I liked it. And the way that this talks about habit, community, and memory sounds fascinating to me. So it is something I would want to read. Not right now. <laughs> Next is also something that I really definitely want to read, although it has a terrible cover. And actually somebody just commented, and I think it was my Friday Reads video, to say that they loved this book, but it has a terrible cover. And I feel like that's true. It is shortlisted for the National Book Award. I'm really looking forward to reading it. My library does not have a copy. It's not on any of my subscription apps. I may have to order a copy from my local indie, well, it's Montana Book Company, The Town of Babylon by Alejandro Varela. Here's what they say. Varela's assured debut stands out for its frank and vulnerable account of a gay Latinx man's return to his suburban Texas hometown for his 20th high school reunion where run-ins with former classmates send him reeling. Varela's take on how the town shaped Andres and continues to affect his life is irresistible. I am really looking forward to reading this book. I just need to figure out where I can get a copy. This is something that I would absolutely prioritize before the end of the year, for sure. Uh, and again, we have a couple of things on here that are finalists for the National Book Award. First of all, The Rabbit Hutch, this one, and there was another one, and I can't remember what it, I think there was another one. Maybe I just can't remember what it was. But yeah, so good list if you haven't already encountered it, but uh, definitely check it out. I really want to get a copy of The Town of Babylon. Then we get to another book I own and have not gotten to, True Biz, a novel by Sarah. Novik, here's what they say, Novik's spiky anthem of teenage rage centers on a school for the deaf and a student whose parents just don't understand. She struggles to learn sign language while her parents refuse, and she has headaches from the cochlear implant forced on her. Along the way, Novik generously and ingeniously conveys the intersection of languages. That is a topic that I really have become interested in over the last year. I've been interested in it, but, and I admit I'm a little basic because part of the movement in this direction for me came from the movie Coda, which I love, but also because I read a memoir by Niall DeMarco called Deaf Utopia. And it's really, a, all of those are really about the experience of being deaf in the world and in a world that is built for people who can hear and the ways in which you are sort of forced to conform, like the idea that your parents would not learn sign language is awful and yet it happens all the time and people like Niall DeMarco talks about being sent to a school for the deaf in which the teachers did not know sign language which is an appalling thing that should not happen and yet it does I'm really interested in this one if I can get to it before the end of the year I would love to but even if I don't this is something that is on my list to get to at some point in the near future Next is The Village Idiot by Steve Stern. Stern, whose genius works of fiction suffuse history with the magic of Jewish folklore, is a writer still awaiting his due. This one, a masterwork of time and memory from the point of view of an expressionist painter, Chaim Soutine, might just become the sleeper success he deserves. And you can tell he's somebody who flies under the radar because I have not heard of him. I have not heard of this book until this exact moment. So I'm going to open the full review of this in another tab and circle back to it and see if this is something that I might be interested in reading. And that actually is the end of the list. So we have covered Publishers Weekly's top 10 books of 2022, but only the five fiction books. And we have covered their 20 best fiction books as well. I would love to hear what you think of the list, if there's anything you are surprised is not here, if there's anything you would like to tell people to read, because again, I feel like this is a list that is rich in discovery. You go through here, and the reason I wanted to talk about this list is there's a lot to find out here. 
even just that last author. I had not heard of him at all, and now I'm going to try to see if he's someone that I would like to seek out for myself. So if there's a book you'd like to make a case for or an author, let me know in the comment section down below. Otherwise, let me know what you think of this list. I feel like it's just really good for that sense of discovery. But let me know what you think in the comment section down below. As always, I really appreciate your time, and I will be back. Until next time, happy reading.